1991. I'm sitting in the driver's seat of my Chevy Chevette. Anyone else have one of those? Yeah, it's our youngest crowd. Okay, thank you. Uh, and a uh, piece of junk car, right? Like uh, me sitting in that car, not a good idea. You know, it was just a terrible, terrible day. And uh, it's one of those cars that was so old and rusted out, there was a spot I had to put my foot, if it was raining, to keep water from splashing through into my face. And so, terrible car, terrible day. I'm sitting in silence, just staring out the windshield. Got my hands on the wheel, but I'm not going anywhere. You see, I'm sitting outside of the house of my brand new ex-girlfriend. Uh, it was mutual. It's never mutual when a guy says it's mutual, right? It was never mutual. I got dumped, and uh, it was a terrible, terrible day. I've got tears streaming down my face because, you see, I had invested everything in this relationship. I had walked away from some friendships. I had my family at full arm's length, and my faith in God was nowhere to be found anywhere around me. As I sat there, a little dazed and confused, disillusioned with a life I had pursued in the absolute wrong direction, I just heard this voice in my head say two simple words, come back. And I look at that day and I identify it as one of the biggest pivot points of my life. My guess is many of you have a specific point uh, in time when you turned from a messed up destructive direction and began walking with God. Well, for the past five weeks, we've been working our way through the book of Mark. We're a whole chapter done, and, and, and we've seen some really incredible, remarkable pivot points in the lives of several people. Peter and his brother leave their fishing nets in the family business to follow Jesus. A man is healed from demon possession. Peter's mother-in-law is healed from her deathbed. And last week, Josh took us through a couple of our favorite Jesus stories, healing of two men, one who had leprosy and one who was paralyzed. So there's absolutely a buzz surrounding Jesus. He's growing in popularity and people are coming from near and far to encounter him. And his followers had to be ecstatic Uh, They had maybe some different ideas of what this was going to be about. Everything in their eyes is moving up and to the right. And they couldn't be happier with the numbers of people and, and the stories that they're telling to their friends about what this new lifestyle of theirs looks like. But starting today and for the next several weeks, we're going to see a Jesus who says and does things that are offensive to the in crowd. And his ministry starts to become more and more controversial. And this morning, we're going to take a quick dive in the book of Mark, chapter 2. We're going to take a look at a story uh, that is just five verses, starting in in verse 13. Uh, People uh, who need Jesus, but they didn't realize it yet. And so this quick dive into a story about a man named Levi who's also named Matthew. We'll get to that a little bit. But it's a story, it's about them, but it's just as much about us in some ways. So Mark 2, starting in verse 13, we read, Then Jesus went out to the lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting in his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Later, Levi followed G- or invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with, with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. So they're walking along while Jesus is talking to this mass of people, new people seemingly joining in every step along the way. 
when everything changes. Suddenly the caravan of people slows down and maybe even comes to a stop and Jesus quits teaching about whatever he was teaching to them at that moment. And everyone has had their eyes fixed on Jesus, taking in every word, but secretly wondering if they're going to get to see a miracle that they've heard about that day. And as they pause to look around, they realize they're at a place they've been to far too many times in their lives. They're at a tax collector's table. And sitting there is Levi, the tax collector. Now understand this, a tax collector, it's really easy to start making some jokes about this. A tax collector isn't the same thing as an IRS agent. Because an IRS agent works within a set of rules and simply enforces what others decide they should enforce. And you may not like what a modern day tax person does, but they're not the same. It's a, it's a profession that is honest and honorable today. But it wasn't the case at that point. See, tax collectors of Jesus' day were anything but honorable. In fact, they were despised and really for good reason. Roman citizens, you see, they, they paid almost nothing in taxes. And this was because the provinces and territories that Rome had control of, like the Jewish people, paid such high taxes. And the Romans did almost none of the dirty work. Instead, they would map out a territory by town or neighborhood and put it up for bid, and a Jewish person would win the bid and go to work collecting taxes. And to put it in modern-day terms, if, if they bid $100,000 for this neighborhood, they were expected to collect $100,000 just to break even. But if they wanted to make a decent living for their family... Uh, he would need to demand even more from these oppressed people. So there were toll taxes. <clears throat> there were business taxes and land taxes. There were travel taxes where you would travel, to, you would pay a tax to go one direction and then pay another tax to come back. There were livestock taxes, uh, heavy taxes on fishermen, and there was even a, a tax specific to the Jewish people, just called a religion tax. If they wanted to go to the temple, they would have to pay a tax. So you can understand that it was not a popular position. The system was working so well for the Romans that they even assigned a centurion, a Roman soldier, to each tax collector. And really what these people did is acted as a cousin Guido, right? They would act as the person that if someone grumbled or refused to pay, they'd take him out back and convince them to pay their taxes. So extortion and strong-arming and backstabbing, those things became the norm of the day. And so here sits Levi feeling the stares of Jesus and the entire crowd. And probably looking down at the ground, he is ready to be struck or cursed and spat upon or simply reminded that he was a traitor of his own people. And the truth is he was. He was hated by everyone, probably even the Romans, because they recognize a sellout when they see one. My guess is that none of the hatred compared to the hatred that Levi had for himself, because he knew that he had made a mess of his life and it didn't seem like there was any way out. He's denied entry into religious services, rejected by his family. He's considered unclean. He was at the same time very wealthy but also extremely bankrupt. Levi was every bit the outcast as the leper would have been, but he knew the difference was he got there by choice. And all these other stories that we talked about, they got there by chance. Levi had made decisions that got him where he was. And whether the people said it out loud or under the breath, you know the consistent message was, let him have it, Jesus. He's betrayed our people and this faith that you're promoting. Instead, what they hear is, Levi, follow me and become my disciple. And everything about his life and his identity changes because of this moment. This story is told in both Mark, where we just read from, and Luke. And both of those authors use his given name, Levi. But if you look at the story where he recounts this story himself... In Matthew chapter 9, 
he starts to go by that new nickname, Matthew. He starts to go by the name that Jesus would call him, which means gift of Yahweh. And so understand this. He goes from being public enemy number one to a gift of God. That's different, isn't it? It's a different perspective that he has of what's taking place. I want to make sure that we understand just a couple of things from this story today. Uh, there's a few of you that are repping your, your favorite team today, right? And we just basically said, wear something of tells us who you're for. And, and I see Green Bay and I see all kinds of things. I saw, there was someone at the last service in a referee uniform, kind of a strange guy, right? Uh, he's a great guy, but it was strange. Uh, we saw a whole family dressed in, in Iowa Hawkeyes gear. And so we told them about other churches in town and said, you, you can go there. That's not true. We love having them here. Uh, maybe you're wearing, I've seen lots of chief stuff. Uh, maybe you didn't get the memo, right, that you're not playing today. Uh, and, and I thought, well, I'm going to wear my team. And, and I'm, a, I'm a, don't tell people this, but I'm a Dolphins fan, all right? And it's been 29 years since I felt any joy in my life, right? And so, so I choose to cover up my pain. But I do so with more pain, right? And so things just aren't working out for me in the, in the sports world. So the question is, who are you for? And this story screams to us that Jesus is for sinners. And the good news is that if Jesus is for sinners, it means he's for me and he's for you. He's for us. And maybe your concept of God growing up has been that God's just waiting to strike you down. And this story tells you that he is for you. Uh, Jesus is for sinners. It means he's for us. Uh, Psalm, or Romans 3.10 reminds us of the psalm, no one is righteous, not even one. You see, we've fallen short of the glory of God. Pastor Chris Brown says Christianity is the only club where you have to be unqualified to get in. And he's right. Grace is the gift of being accepted before we become acceptable. God's love for you is constant and consistent and not dictated by our performance. I love just how quickly this all happened. Jesus says, follow me, and Matthew doesn't ask, well, where or why or what will I be doing? He just gets up and leaves everything behind, seeing that there's a way out of this lifestyle that he's created for himself. You see, Matthew understood that when grace calls, you don't ask if you can call back later. Jesus accepts the unacceptable, and he models something that we work really hard at here at Third City, and he allows Matthew to belong in spite of his past behavior. And so we use these three words, belong and believe and behave, but sometimes the church makes the mistake of flipping those around, and we expect people to behave, clean themselves up before they come to church. What a ridiculous notion, like try and do something without the help of the Holy Spirit that only the Holy Spirit can help us do because I can control my actions for a short period of time. But the truth is I need the doctor. I need Jesus to come into my, my life. So in the same way that we don't expect people to clean themselves up before they take a shower, that'd be ridiculous, right? We don't expect people to have it all together before they meet Jesus, Max Lucado says, Jesus loves you just the way you are. And then he says, but he refuses to leave you there. See, Jesus didn't just have some nice words for Matthew that day and then walk away. He, he actually calls him to step away from what he's doing. And he does the same thing in our lives, and it's called repentance. And that word repentance literally means to walk in a new direction. And Matthew does. He doesn't ask if he can be a tax collector, maybe just part-time. He leaves that behind. Author Dallas Willard says, Becoming an apprentice of Jesus is not something that can be negotiated. Rather, becoming a disciple is a matter of giving up your life as you have understood it to be. We respond to the fact that Jesus is for us by being for him. It's reciprocal. And when you know who you're for, it helps you to know what you're against. If I'm for the dolphins, I'm against happiness and joy. Not true. 
<laughs> but it seems to be true. But the truth is, if I'm for Jesus, I become against the destructive power of sin and selfishness in my life. And I let him do what only he can do in me. And don't miss these two words about Levi. It says, he arose. It's the same two words that Josh read to us last week about the paralyzed man. In both instances, we see a miracle take place because forgiveness is absolutely a miracle. It's not something we can do on our own. But both of them took an action. And Matthew arose and he followed Jesus. Which brings us to our second thing I want to make sure that we understand. And so if Jesus is for sinners, let's just put one more word in there and say that Jesus is for all sinners. And this is where things get a little bit more uncomfortable for us sometimes. You see, Jesus is having dinner at Matthew's house, and we're told that Matthew's scummy friends are seated there with him, as are the first of Jesus' disciples. It'd be interesting to be a, a fly on the wall of that room to see the fishermen who had paid so much in taxes to the tax collector. And sometimes church can be like that. You sit across the aisle from maybe someone who mistreated you, or someone who cheated you in business, or someone who let you down in a relationship. But we're glad to see each other here because it means we are on the road to recovery. And we're told that some Pharisees are there. It's the first mention of Pharisees in the book of Mark. And they're probably in the street watching the party that's taking place in Matthew's courtyard. These are the rule keepers and the rule enforcers. And this party is probably taking place outdoors under a covered patio because the table would be large and wouldn't fit inside his house. And so they're probably in the street looking through the gate with a little bit of disdain of what's taking place. And they get the attention of some disciples, maybe Peter and Andrew, and they say, hey, if he's who he says he is, why is he hanging out with them? And before his disciples can answer, Jesus looks at them and coins his mission statement. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. See, I think that table, I think it was plenty big. And there would have been room for the Pharisees to have a seat and enjoy the party. But they were more concerned with being great gatekeepers. See, the illness of the Pharisees is believing that they themselves were well. And then despising those who were there to see the doctor. Understand that this story is about Matthew and, there are, and, the, and the others who were at the table, but it's also about something bigger than them. See, Jesus is acting out a prophecy from the book of Isaiah in chapter 25, a, a passage that everyone at this table of Jewish descent would be very familiar with. It says, God will throw a feast for all the people of the world, a feast of the finest foods, a feast with vintage wines, a feast of seven courses, a feast with uh, lavish with gourmet desserts. And here on this mountain, God will banish the pall of doom hanging over all peoples, the shadow of doom darkening all nations. Yes, he'll banish death forever. And God will wipe the tears from every face and he'll remove every sign of disgrace from his people wherever they are. See, in this interaction, Jesus is calling us to a big table mindset. And now in both word and deed, he's saying the kingdom of God has come near. And in fact, the kingdom of God is here. We're in it. It has begun. The banquet is taking place right now. And it might be a little bit different than what you thought it was going to be sat down with Derek, one of our mission partners, a few days ago. I wanted to ask him some questions about the work that he does. Derek lives here in the Grand Island area, but he works and coaches missionaries that are working in the most unreached corners of our globe, uh, the, the, most places, the places that are most desperate to hear about Jesus. I want, to learn, want you to learn a little bit about what they're doing to invite people to this big table. Derek, I, I just want to ask you, like, give us an idea of what it is that you do. In 2015, Third City was part of sending us to Southeast Asia. We've moved back now to Nebraska, but that calling is, is still there. 
basically now um, I'm a coach and a mentor, um, sometimes even uh, doing some shepherding um, for kingdom workers that are still there in that region. We've been talking about this big table concept that we're reading about in Mark chapter two. Yeah. How do you see that developing uh, in the places where your people are? There was one gal, um, she had a dream of Jesus, uh, this Muslim woman, and Jesus came to her in her dream and was talking with her, and then he just turned into water. And then this little kid in the dream came and got a pitcher of water and gave it to this woman and she drank it. And she woke up and she was like, what is that, you know, what's going on? She had um, a Christian friend to actually go and ask, hey, I had a dream, Jesus came to me and I drank his water, <laughs> or drank him. And the friend said, oh, I think, like, let's turn to John 4. I think it's John 4 where Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And uh, he said that, you know, in that passage, that he's the living water, mm. and whoever drinks from him will never be thirsty again. And she read that, and she came to faith in Jesus. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, now she's counting that cost right now. And there's a lot of other projects and, and, th and things that we have going on. Yeah, tell me a little bit about the, the digital uh, thing that you guys are doing on social media. A lot of times the place we're working, you know, it's about a five million person people group. And uh, most, for centuries, people have lived and died without ever mm -hmm. even meeting a Christian, without ever having access to God's word, without ever having access to a church. And um, so we're trying to get creative and, and figure out ways to get the word out to people. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of amazing things with media going on online, social media. And uh, so we do have a media strategy um, to engage with people who are seeking, to engage with people who maybe had an encounter like that, a dream or a vision, or maybe they're just wondering, you know, what is truth and they're, or they're searching for peace. Um, mm. And so um, we have a team uh, there on the ground and I work with them and we, we create content and we put it out there and uh, we get messages every day um, from people who are seeking who've maybe never encountered another Jesus mm -hmm. follower. Hey, I know there's also this incredible opportunity for our people to join yeah. your ministry in this prayer emphasis. So tell us about that. Yeah, so every Ramadan, which is actually the month where Muslims are fasting and, and seeking God, we create a prayer guide because we feel like um, it's a really strategic time mm -hmm. uh, to pray and for them to encounter the truth and encounter the Lord. So this will be our sixth year uh, writing this prayer guide and it's been amazing to see as we've prayed in years past, God answer those really specific prayers. And uh, we're asking um, God this year for 10 churches to join us um, in praying in this 30 day journey um, to see his name glorified in this corner of the world where not very many people know him at all. Well, I can tell you, we're gonna be one of those 10 churches and uh... Uh, there's an opportunity for you uh, on the church app, the Third City app, you can go to the events tab and uh, click on that and it'll be the first thing up there where you can show your interest to receive one of these prayer guides. And if you don't have the app, uh, you can stop by one of the hubs and uh, sign up on a, on a form there where you can get the same information. But uh, we're excited uh, for, for a, a large number of you to join in this prayer emphasis. I want you to listen to the words of Jesus in Luke 13. People will come from all over the world, east and west, north and south. And they'll take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. And that feast, that banquet, it's already started. It's called the church. And we have to decide whether we will celebrate this or if we're going to be a little bit more like the Pharisees and play the role of gatekeeper. I, I hope that you'll join us in this prayer initiative. And it will be a stretching thing for all of us. It'll be a stretching thing for me to constantly be praying for people that I don't even know. Praying that God will, will make a, a big table for them to sit there, sit at uh, where they live in those countries. <laughs> See, the truth about Levi is the same thing that's true about me, and it's the same thing that's true about that lady that Derek told us about. The old Levi was unfixable. 
and the old Dan and the old you. We were unfixable. But the good news of Jesus is that he didn't come to make repairs to a broken me. He came to give us new life. See, I'm here. You're here because of what the doctor did in our lives. I officiated a wedding a few months ago in western Nebraska for a couple that has been attending here at Third City for a little while. And after the ceremony, it was a beautiful outdoor, great weather. It was just a, a wonderful celebration day. And a man came up to me. He had a, a uniform on. He was a deputy. And he reached out to shake my hand. And it was one of those handshakes that had more purpose behind it than a greeting. Because he didn't let go. And it got tighter and tighter. And I thought, this guy's got something to say. So we kept shaking hands, and he told me that he was also a part-time preacher. And he told me that uh, he had been asked to perform the wedding, but he wouldn't because they didn't completely live up to everything that he expected of them. And we're still shaking hands, but with my other hand, I had seen a couple from our church, another couple, and I pointed at him. I said, that's Grant and Katie. Grant and Katie are some of our marriage mentors here at Third City, and if you don't know about this ministry, it's wonderful. It's this ministry that walks alongside couples who are engaged. And I said, Grant and Katie met them where they were at, loved them, and helped them make some really good decisions in their life. We finally quit shaking hands. I think he saw that we weren't going to come to any kind of agreement. As we walked away, I said something to my wife. I'm so glad to be a part of a church that embraces people with grace and helps them walk in new directions rather than hitting them over the head with a club made up of their old mistakes. And I think that's the secret sauce here. We've learned to, as Bob Goff says, put down the badge and pick up grace. I first saw this 25 years ago. I was a young, inexperienced youth minister, and I was just trying to get kids to come from all over the place. And we were in the old building over uh, on O'Flanagan. One of our elders was named Kent Lichtenwalder at that time. Well, he's still named that. Uh, he still worships with us. He was an elder at that time. And Kent's tall, and he walks kind of slow. Reminds you of John Wayne. I was scared of him. I'll just be honest with you. When he speaks, he sounds like a grizzly bear that learned English. He's got a really deep voice. And Kent happened to drive in and see that before youth group started, this group of kids that was pretty rough, they were outside the church smoking cigarettes and doing whatever else they were doing. And afterwards, Kent walks up to me. And he looks at me and says, Dan, I saw those kids outside smoking. And all I could think is, where do I find a cardboard box to pack up my desk? And there was a moment of just kind of awkward silence. And he, he looked at me and he said, I'm so glad they're here. And I realized that there was something about Third City and how we were pursuing Jesus and inviting other people to pursue Jesus that was a little bit different. That we weren't going to hit them over the, over the head with a club made up of their past mistakes. See, that's the heart of Jesus for us. He's invited us to a banquet table, and we're constantly in this process of scooting in a little bit closer to each other to make room for other people who maybe don't think that they qualify making sure there's uh, enough room for everyone who recognizes their sickness and is simply coming to see the doctor. That's why you hear us refer to this time of communion as the Lord's table. Because it reminds us of this banquet. And it reminds us of this big table. It reminds us that we're not the gatekeepers. We reach out with grace. so glad that there was room for me at this table. And I'm so glad that there's room for you. I'm so glad that you're here.
means that we've recognized grace. And we sit at this table together. So Lord, we take this couple of minutes to be reminded of a sacrifice that was made by Jesus for us. Perfection for complete imperfection. Life that was given, blood that was poured out so that we can be in relationship with you and sit at this banquet table, this big table. Let that invitation go out strongly, both to ourselves and to the people around us. Thank you that because of what Jesus has done, the worst things about me are not the final things about me. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, I think if Jesus were here uh, and he unzipped his jacket and, and pulled it, it would just say you. <laughs> he's for you. And the fact that he's for you means that he's for a whole bunch of other people as well. And so uh, I don't want to miss this part of this story. Because the very first thing that Matthew does as a follower of Jesus is he throws a party for Jesus. And he invites all of his friends that were in the same boat as him. He invites them because he wants them to meet the doctor that changed his life. And I know that it's really tempting sometimes to think, someday I'll be ready. Someday I'll know enough. I'll be far enough down this path of walking with Jesus that I'll be ready to tell someone else about it. Can I just tell you, you are more ready than you realize. And it's not because you know all of the theology or you you can't cite all of the verses, things like that but you're ready because you're in relationship with people. You're ready because you recognize that you aren't the doctor. You just know how to get people to the doctor. And if that's as simple as an invite to hear, great. But maybe it looks like you become different at work. You let your joy shine through more. Maybe you're different in the neighborhood. And maybe it's any of the stuff that we've been talking about for the last year about how it's the end of me and the beginning of we. And you represent him wherever you go. And that doesn't mean that you take over in the second quarter tonight and give a sermon at your party. Don't do that. That would be weird. But it is an opportunity to build that relationship, to love people where they're at. Let them see your joy so that they might say someday, I want what you have. You are more ready than you realize.